Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host Paul and earlier you saw Max on the gun. So if I were to ask you what the most common complaints for LPVOs, what would they be? My guess, just based on the comments, is you guys are always looking for lighter, shorter, and cheaper. Well, those guys at Primary Arms must have been also reading the same comments because they're back at it again with an update to one of the scopes we looked at last year, the Platinum 1-8. I'll link to it if you haven't already seen it. And now that we spent some time with this compact version, I'll tell you what, when Primary Arms set out to make the best LPVO they could to carry their name, they succeeded. So to see why that is, we're gonna take a closer look at it right now. So let's go. So out of the box, you'll notice some changes right away. In comparison to its larger predecessor, this compact is over an inch shorter at 9.28 inches long. It's not as short as the March 1 and 10 we looked at recently, but for guys that want something less than the average 10 inches, I think you'll be really happy with its shortened profile. Along those same lines, they also shrank the scope from a 34 millimeter tube to a 30 millimeter tube. For us, you guys know we like the Warren X scale mounts since they have excellent QD levers and their split rings are really stable. And speaking of weight, this is the biggest change you'll notice. Considering that it's 34 millimeter Big Brother came in at 26.9 ounces, this compact is a featherweight coming in at only 16.95 ounces. So I think this is the lightest 1.8 scope we've seen so far on this channel. And yeah, when you're swinging the gun around, you can definitely appreciate that weight savings. But as you guys know from the March review, it's best to look closer for any compromises anytime you go lighter, shorter, and cheaper. So now that we've had our first impressions, let's see how the scope really performs. And the first question, is it daylight bright? Well, at cranked up to max brightness in our typical harsh desert noon lighting, our answer is no. I say that when your definition points to a standard like the Vortex PST or the Razor. I'd classify this type of illumination as daylight red instead of daylight bright, since you do notice a color change, but it's not quite enough on a bright day like this. Although if you compare the Horseshoe at 1X between the older PLX and this one, you're not gonna see much difference. More specifically, if your target is white, like uh, our Ipsic steel, then it may appear bright enough for you. But if you're panning into a shaded area or something with darker tones, that center chevron is a little hard to see at 1X. Speaking of that center, I think the horseshoe is big enough that you don't necessarily need to run it with uh, full illumination. I don't have the exact subtensions for this horseshoe, but it looks to be about 20 mils wide. Along with that, primary arms added these crosshair posts, which are thick enough at 1X to help really guide your eye towards the center. So if you had this scope, I can see that just not even running illumination because it's, I don't think it's really that needed. Outside of the reticle, this compact version continues the tradition of just sitting on some really excellent Japanese glass. In fact, I think the ED glass might actually look a little bit clearer, but if you were to nitpick, maybe there's a little bit of distortion towards the very edge of the scope, but you have to look really hard to see it. So while we're talking about that 1X view, this is where I think you'll notice the biggest difference between the compact and its big brother. At 121 feet, the field of view on the 1X is wider than the Vortex Razor, which is kind of crazy, and you'll notice it right away. In fact, it's so wide that I would really recommend you set the diopter right away. That way you'll get the view as flat as possible. And the bezel is so thin that the separation between real targets outside of your scope and the target inside your view is really almost seamless. It's like looking through a 1X red dot. And like the Razor, this is one of the scopes that you hand to somebody who's new to LPVOs, and they'll just go, oh man. That looks awesome. I gotta get me one of these. Now that we've taken a look inside, let's back out and talk externals. So right off the bat, this scope is really speaking to me when it comes to turrets. Since you don't typically dial, you want covered turrets like what you see here. Not only does it protect the turret, but they're typically lower profile and they're less weight as well. But once you have the caps off, you can find that dialing these turrets is super nice. Like reminding me a lot of the Vortex Razor turrets. It's got plenty of positive feedback between clicks and those clicks measure a precise 0.1 mil. But if you're really into dialing and tactical turrets are your thing, primary arms included those as well. And you just swap in between them if you'd like, which is a really smart move. Now looking back at the rear, that's where you'll find the diopter and the zoom ring. As mentioned on the diopter, you'll want to adjust that as soon as possible since the scope has such a wide field of view. As to the zoom ring, you can use the included aluminum throw lever. It's, the throw lever works really well, so you can manipulate it with just your finger, and it sits at nine and three o'clock positions at the extremes. Or if you rather just muscle your way through the zoom ring, you can you have this really nice knurling around it. 
As far as friction, it turns a lot smoother than the Vortex Razor and a little bit smoother than its big brother. I think the lever works well, although I do wish it was a little bit thicker for a little bit more leverage. Lastly, on the left, you'll find the rotary illumination knob that, that goes between one to 10, and there is an off position in between. The friction in between them is really good. So once you set the level, it's not gonna move if you accidentally bump it. And also you do get some uh, positive feedback and some clicking when you're actually turning it. Also, you'll notice there's a little bit of knurling on that knob as well to make it a little bit easier to turn. So all these little details that primary arms included for this scope really help set the scope apart. Now that we've seen how the scope performs at short range, let's take a look at it when we zoom up. Primary Arms has two reticles for this optic and they're both BDC. So for now, your choice is either the Raptor M8 yards or the M8 meters. As you can see, the M8 yards has a lot more hold and is a little bit more busy. So we elected the M8 meters, which is a little bit more clean and still has plenty of features. Starting with the center horseshoe and chevron, I think which are large enough to pick up on one X. And once you zoom in, it's spaced wide enough and far enough on the center chevron that the horseshoe lines aren't blocking any of your view of targets. Along that same line, your thick crosshair post push out to the side wide enough so that you can see plenty of real estate around that center reticle as well. It has moving target holds on the horizontal axis in line with the chevron. I haven't shot a moving man target yet, so maybe these are accurate. I'm not sure, but at least you have some reference points. And if you don't have your laser range finder handy, this scope has two methods for passive ranging. For full man size targets, you've got the large auto ranging stadia on the left and right sides of the scope. So if you line up your target vertically, your target is in between these four to 800 meter lines. But if you wanna go with shoulder width ranging, the drop ladder has those much like an ACOG does. So if your target lines up at the shoulders with the four line, then you know your target is at 400 meters. The drop ladder also has a lot of wind holds going from five to 20 miles an hour in five mile increments. So knowing all this, to shoot some long distance, we'll have to pull up Strelic for our holds. Now this scope is so new that the Raptor M8 reticles are not in Strelic yet. So what we did, we chose the Raptor M2 and shot it to see how closely they match. As far as test ammo and rifle, we're using 55 grain reloads going 27, 22, a little slow with a hundred yard zero through our 60 inch criterion barrels. And Strelic tells us these are our holds for that. Hopefully we're close. So now we have our holds. The next step is to test them on our known distance range. Our range will have reduced size IPSIX from two to 400 yards, and we'll correct for misses if need be. Max will be our shooter, so take it away, Max. Okay, 200. Hey. Hit. Three hundred. Hit. Hit. Four hundred. Hit. Hit. Nice job. All right, everybody, we're back. So, what's the final verdict on this new one to eight compact? So, if this channel gave out star ratings, this scope almost took the five star crown. If that illumination was just a little bit brighter, it would have been absolutely the runaway favorite this year. So at $1,500, I think if you are running and gunning, I still think the Vortex Razor 1 to 6 is the one to beat. But if you're looking to upgrade from 1 to 6 and you're looking for more general purpose scope, then for sure I have no reservation saying this is a scope to get. So that's it from us. But how about you guys? What do you guys think about this 1 to 8 compact? And how important is that illumination to you? Jump down in the comment section and let us know. And lastly, thanks again for tuning in this channel. Subscribe if you haven't already done so. And thanks again for joining us. I'll see you guys again next time. Thank you.